Hi everyone, say hello to Bella. Now if you link the title of this video with the act of Bella on my lap, you should pretty much know my position about dogs within Islam. This is my own personal position. But in Islam, it's not so clear. It is one of those elements that seems to elicit a debate between various schools of jurisprudence. And this conflict of religious conundrums is not only experienced within the chambers of Muslim scholars, but if you live or have lived in any Muslim nation, you could witness the extreme caution and wariness many Muslims have pertaining to dogs. For example, when walking Bella in many a Muslim country, most Muslim people will automatically move away from our walking path or direction, either by you turning their way away from us, or by establishing a safe zone more conducive of an exaggerated COVID social distancing protocol. Such an experience is common and seems to thrive on the element of fear. But why is this? So let's get down to the heart of the matter. The extremities of the licensing and prohibition of the relationships with dogs is huge. One Muslim legal system, the Maliki school, totally allows for the comprehensive interaction with dogs and considers them as pure creations of Allah. While on the other end of the debate, the Hanbali school made out dogs not only as impure and prohibited across the board, but also introduced a fear and hatred element into the way in which Muslims considered and interacted with such a godly creation. Of course, there are many other schools that fall in between these two extreme interpretations. Some allow for the dog's purity except for its saliva, whereas others only allow ownership of dogs that have specific roles, as in hunting, herding, and more recently, guide dogs. But to understand the fundamental underlying principle that is the only cause for this debate, we have to define it. And that is the qualification of najasa. Najasa or najis in its adjective form means essentially unclean or impure. In Islam, being exposed to najis elements or beings have certain consequences and hence necessitate specific reactions. Najis items can include pigs, animal excrements, externalized blood, cadavers, and the topic of our discussion, dogs. Yet this last inclusion, dogs, is contentious, as we will see in the following layout of the cases either for the allowance of dogs or the cases against them. The case for the license of dog ownership and interaction in Islam comes from parts of the Quran as well as from numerous hadiths. One major position of strength for the case for dogs is the fact that there is no clear prohibition of dogs in the Quran, say like how the consumption of pork was clearly considered mentioned as sinful. Dogs are mentioned five times and in each, dogs are revered as noble and loyal creatures. And you would have thought they were awake though they were asleep. We turned them over to the right and left, while their dog stretched his forelegs at the entrance. Had you looked at them, you would have certainly fled away from them, filled with awe of them. This verse is a small part of the longer Surat Al-Kahf, meaning the cave, where a group of persecuted believers, along with their dog, Qatmir, found refuge in a cave and slept for centuries while being protected by their dog. Companionship between believer and canine is established in this verse, reflecting a strong and positive bond between the two. They ask you, O Muhammad, what has been made lawful for them? Say, lawful for you are all good foods and game caught by what you have trained of hunting animals which you trained as Allah has taught you. So eat of what they catch for you and mention the name of Allah upon it. In this Quranic verse, Allah is alluding to the lawfulness of eating all fruits that are caught by hunting animals, of which dogs and falcons were the most common in the region at the time. This revelation explains how dogs and other animals were an integral part of Muslim societies. I said, O Messenger of Allah, we are a people who hunt. He said, if you send your dog and you mention the name of Allah upon it and he catches something for you, then eat it. I said, even if he kills it? He said, even if he kills it. Here it is evident that the impurity of a dog's saliva, which is the main claim against the purity of dogs, is put into question. How can a retrieving dog fetch a prey in his mouth, while at the same time allowing for the hunter to consume the game, especially if the dog's saliva was nedges? The prophet reiterates in response to an inquiring hunter that it is fine to eat the meat 
even after a dog's retrieval. The dogs would come and go through the mosques during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, and they did not sprinkle water to cleanse any of that. What this hadith represents is that there was a proximity and a regularity to dogs around Muslims of early Islam that indicates a high level of cohabitation. Without any fear or panic towards the impurity of dogs, even within the purest of places, mosques. A man saw a dog eating mud from the severity of thirst. So that man took a shoe and filled it with water and kept on pouring the water for the dog till it quenched its thirst. So Allah approved his deed and made him to enter paradise. This account presents a major principle in Islam that all animals are to be respected and treated with the utmost of dignity. Again, this hadith reveals how empathy towards a dog could lead to a great reward, putting into question the conclusion of some Islamic schools that dogs are evil and should be eschewed. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. The case against the ownership and interaction with dogs comes strictly from the narrated accounts of the Prophet, the Hadiths. If a dog drinks from the utensil of any of you, it is essential to wash it seven times. Here, the element of the dog's saliva, as impure and najis, is extracted. With an intense seven cycles of washing of any element, be it a utensil or other, the repetitious act represents a high level of uncleanliness of a dog's mouth. The Messenger of Allah was upset one morning, and Maymuna said to him, O Messenger of Allah, you look upset today. He said, Jibreel, peace be upon him, had promised to meet me last night, but he did not come, and by Allah, he never failed to keep an appointment. The day passed, and he thought of a puppy that was beneath a table in the house. He ordered that it be taken out, and then he took some water in his hand and sprinkled it over the place where it had been. That evening, Jibreel, peace be upon him, came and met him. The Messenger of Allah said to him, You promised to meet me last night, he said. Yes, but we do not enter a house in which there is a dog or a picture. It is no longer the impurity of a dog's saliva that is being questioned, but the total presence of a dog within a house that is being relayed. The whole dog is najis, and hence no angels will enter a house occupied by a dog. Allah's Messenger ordered us to kill dogs, and we carried out this order so much so that we also killed the dog coming with a woman from the desert. Then Allah's Apostle forbade their killing. He, the Prophet, further said, it is your duty to kill the jet black dog having two spots on the eyes, for it is a devil. Initially a command understood as to kill all dogs, and subsequent to a moment of further revelation by the Prophet, then led to a qualification on the killing of a certain dog, a dog type that was evil that had certain physical attributes. He who keeps a dog other than that meant for watching the herd or for hunting, loses every day out of his deeds equal to two qirat. In this hadith, we see a more detailed and qualified assessment of which dog is allowed to be kept, only dogs that have function. And should a dog be kept in a Muslim's home that is outside of function, then they will lose out on the many good deeds they have accumulated over their lifetime. What we have just gone through are the main proofs that either side of the argument resort to in making their cases. In isolation, the against dogs case can seem extremely harsh and absent of any affection towards dogs and counter to Islamic treatment of animals in general. But that is where I believe we have to introduce context. Context not only to rationalize the two polarities or their proofs, but to also provide more information in assessing the various hadiths as they're ultimately narrations from a specific time and place. And hence time and place must have had a bearing on their interpretations. And one of the most impactful elements of context is the understanding of what made up the term and grouping of dogs back in the 6th and 7th century. When utilizing the word dog, this included all dogs, trained dogs for hunting or herding, wild dogs who roamed the desert, stray dogs who had no ownership but were within the urbanized centers, and even rabid dogs who were considered a major threat to society even up to our day and age. So the word dog back then included a larger iteration of dangerous dogs. 
wild dogs, and rabid dogs, an array that doesn't really exist in our times. For example, when the Prophet commanded to kill the dogs, a major interpretation could have been to euthanize the rabid dogs or wild dogs that were causing great harm to the local populations and their herds. The other interpretation of a blank instruction to kill all dogs just doesn't align with the ethics of Islam in dealing with Allah's animal creations. And I believe this is where interpretation establishes these extremist positions. There are two more critical interpretations that can rationalize further many of the hadiths that seem to defend one extremist point of view while countering the other. The first is the fundamental importance of hygiene in Islam. This is an element that transcends dogs or any other creature. It is a way of life and a vital aspect of the faith. When it comes to dogs and their saliva or any other animal for that matter, it is cleanliness over anything else, najasa or not. So to deem an animal najis and impure to then force believers to conduct themselves in a specific way is unnecessary. Muslims should always take care of their hygiene at all times, when they arise, before they pray, before and after they eat, and when they're ready for bed. So interactions with a dog should automatically simply be offset by the hygienic traditions of the faith. The second interpretation is about the value of a dog, or any other animal over that of a human. Islam prioritizes humans over any other being. Respect and care for sure are given to animals, but not at the expense of a human. One can be linked emotionally to a dog, care for it, befriend it, yet a dog should be a complementary relationship and not as a replacement for human and more specifically family and friends relations. Dogs and the keeping of dogs are a personal choice, as I mentioned earlier. It's a big responsibility that can have wonderful reward and at the same time be a terrible burden. It's not for me to say if it's halal or haram, allowed or prohibited. But what I can share is that there is too much fear and hatred for dogs. None of that should really apply. Not owning a dog relieves all Muslims of engaging in this discussion in the first place. So if you don't want to own a dog, then don't, and you'll be totally exonerated of this conundrum. But for me, the issue is different to that. Why the fear or hatred in the presence of a dog? Is it najasa, the impurity? Well then, in the most extreme school of jurisprudence, one may simply wash away the impurities and carry on. But if you're walking down a street and about to come into close proximity to a dog, big or small, instead of the fear, how about a little kindness and appreciation for one of Allah's creations? <laughs>